Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and konnichiwa from Thai Japan. I am Sriram, president of Thai Japan, and I have a couple of my colleagues here as well as in the room. I am delighted to bring this important session. The general impression is Japan has a lot of money and everybody thinks they can get it. But in reality, there is a lot of science as much as art in order to get meaningful you know, investors coming in uh, for India. I have two extraordinarily insightful people with me on the panel today. Let me introduce them before I hand it over to them. So I have Dr. Yamamoto. He is a former banker turned management consultant turned a private equity expert. He is part of Unison Capital, one of the first independently created private equity firm in Japan. He'll talk more about it in his session. Then I have another doctor, PhD, Dr. Manoj Jain. Uh, he calls himself MJ. Everybody calls himself as MJ. So MJ is a consultant turned entrepreneur. He was uh, instrumental in creating an analytics firm, even before the word analytics was very fashionable. He scaled the company and, and exited at the right time when analytics became fashionable. And then after that, he decided that he's going to look at the investment world. So he is a very active investor through multiple vehicles, both in India and in Singapore and, and other parts of the world. So today's session is really to look at how should India and Japan work together in a very meaningful way, especially in the context of leveraging Japanese capital for the Indian ecosystem. If we can unlock the potential, I think it looks an awesome combination, which can be very transformative, not only for both the countries, but also for the entire world. Let me stop here. I'll hand it over to Dr. Yamamoto first to give a little overview of what Unison is, what the landscape is, and then he will hand it over to MJ, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A. So all set, over to you, Dr. Yamamoto. Well, thank you, Sridam san Ladies and gentlemen, it is our absolute pleasure to be invited to this very important event, Thai Global Summit. And here uh, we have uh, next uh, 45 minutes or so, we're gonna be talking about our own view about how to raise Japanese capital. Before getting into that, just give you uh, the, how big the opportunity is. In, as an entity, Japanese pension system has an AUM of uh, 4 trillion US dollar by the, um, uh, as of year 2019. And out of that 4 trillion US dollar AUM, they are allocating just less than 0.8% of their asset to their alternative asset class. Wherever you are, whatever you do, we belong to the same asset class, which is alternative asset class. I'm PE, you are VC, or you are entrepreneur. We share one thing, we are alternative. So alternative to what? Alternative to traditional asset class. So let's start our short journey. Uh, next slide, please. MJ, can you go full screen? Thank you. So uh, before starting the journey, uh, you know, the, the little bit of the credential of ourselves. Uh, we are from Unison Capital, uh, which is as uh, Sri Ramsan so kindly introduced. Uh, we are one of the first uh, private equity firm independent uh, based in Japan and later in Korea. Uh, up to this point, we have made uh, 42 investment and uh, 26 existed. And as a, as a fund, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, three exited from uh, three uh, Japanese uh, private equity funds. Uh, we have uh, 10 partners, including myself. Uh, we have accumulated uh, you know, uh, many years of uh, investment experience together. 
We have uh, uh, farm wide, we have 41 investment professionals, 22 in Tokyo, and 19 in Seoul office. And our next target is India. Next slide, please. So we have this new brand name, uh, which uh, MJ, my friend and my colleague uh, to our Indian project uh, is going to walk you through momentality, but our brand name is Unison Capital Bridge. Why bridge? It's clear, as Sri Ramsan explained, uh, you, India, has a tons of opportunities. We, Japan, has tons of capital and you know, sitting on the 0% yield. So there's a, you know, inevitable logic why these two should work together. We have three focus. One is uh, ESG. Uh, so Unison Capital is uh, fu uh, fully up to uh, this ESG concept. Whatever we do at the private equity, uh, we are ESG. And our uh, second focal point is uh, India and I'm going to walk you through this. And so the one is, uh, we would like to make an investment and we would like to make a direct investment in sustainability. So those three are the fillers of our new brand, which is Unison Capital Bleach. Next slide, please. A little bit of the background. So this is a puzzle that I, uh, you know, we all should have to solve. On one hand, Japan, India, India, Japan has the greatest, greatest, you know, G2G relationship. Historically and horizontally. You know, the, uh, you know, this is a picture of lovely, you know, our former prime minister of Abe and your current prime minister of Mr. Modi. And they were, they agreed to what they call the Japan and India vision 2025. So what that says, working together for peace and the prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region and the world. This is great. And, uh, you know, everybody knows, uh, everybody in this conference knows that the G2G relationship between our two great nations uh, cannot be better. Next slide, please. Despite the great G2G uh, relationship that we have, there's so little so little asset allocated to India from Japan. Like I said, uh, you know, the uh, big picture, there's 4 trillion US dollar of AUM, and there's 0.8 for less than 0.8% allocation to alternative asset costs. It's, that itself is a huge opportunity for both of us. You know, usually, uh, you know, if you take a, if you pick one or two global uh, uh, pension managers, uh, you name it, CPPIB, Tamasek, Ontario Teachers, all those names, their allocation to alternative asset class from their AUM is well over 30 to 30 or 40 percent these days. They are the top line now. But you know, given that figure. On average, 0.8% is far too low. So there is going to be an increasing allocation from Japanese pension money to alternative asset class. And within an alternative asset class, there is private equity. And within private equity allocation, there is India allocation. Given this simple equation, uh, using uh, applying this to uh, government pension investment fund GPIF, by far the largest pension fund in the world, it has uh, currently around 1.6 trillion AUM by itself. They have zero, zero exposure to India uh, as of March 2019. Uh, March 2019. So I say this is a puzzle. You know our relationship. Our two great nations has a you know almost best best uh, best than ever uh, you know great relationship between the two, but nevertheless, our pension do not seems to be so much into uh, India exposure. Next slide, please. Thank you. So where is the long term patient capital from Japan? 
once again, we say it's from pension system. But in order to do, get the, those money, uh, we all have to, you and I, have to be very mindful of uh, the different uh, uh, mindset of their uh, pension money or in, broader, in a broader sense, institutional investors' mind. So we call this progression model. I'm going to walk you through momentality, but there are other uh, important aspects to this, uh, you know, uh, puzzle. Whenever I say I, I talk uh, with our investors, uh, what do you think about India? Uh, the uh, the following line always comes up to uh, our discussion. Yamamoto-san. Last 20 years, doing nothing in China, especially in the private equity in China. The cost of not doing anything in China over the last 20 years, pro prohibitively high. Whereas India, last 20 years, doing nothing didn't cost us much. That's a reality, that's track record. So uh, going forward, you, us, work together to show tangible risk return, risk adjusted return, and a tangible track record. That's uh, you know a starting point of uh, you know us getting uh, uh, getting a tangible amount of capital from Japan. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is what we call the uh, uh, asset owner progression model. As you can see, uh, there's four stages. Stage four is the end game. And, uh, and stage zero is our entry point. So stage zero, uh, many of the uh, uh, you know, players at stage zero, no program for alternative investments. Uh, they invest only in the traditional asset class. Stage one, they introduce alternative investment programs through gatekeepers. But they, their focus is only on developing markets, i.e. North America. So they are busy right now to build up their relationship uh, with uh, North American GPs, period. Stage two, they expanded the internal team and uh, they have uh, now stage two player uh, now has a core investment capacity. And also uh, they start looking at, uh, you know, Asia Pacific and the rest of the world. We call that AP slash ROW. That's India too. So uh, the stage two player is the, on, uh, the starting point uh, for you to have a meaningful conversation about uh, Indian exposure, whatever shape and form. Stage three, they progress further and a further extension, uh, expansion of internal team. At stage three, they don't have a, dis, a you know, distinction between public equity and the private equity. It's just equity. And public debt and uh, private debt, it's just debt. And also they have now have direct GP selection capacity, i.e. they don't need to gatekeep us. And of course they have full geographic diversification and stage four is the end game. At this, uh, at this juncture, uh, the LP is not LP anymore. They're more like a GP. And they have uh, the capacity to formulate a new JV with other major GPs. And they have full geographic diversification as well. So this is, uh, you know, uh, what, sorry, well, I'm still on this one. Uh, this is what we call the asset owner progression model. And, uh, you know, the reality is vast majority of a four trillion US dollar AUM from a Japanese pension system is still at stage zero. So for you as an AJV, uh, sorry, as a, uh, as a VC based in uh, Mumbai or Bangalore, or you are, if you are the entrepreneur based in the Bangalore, there's no point that you talk with a stage zero player. 
because they don't they do understand the English, but they don't understand what you're talking about because you are alternative asset class. And there's no stage four player in Japan as of today. No, zero. Stage three, there are a couple of them. Uh, name of to name few, uh, Nippon Life, Daiichi Life, or Pension Fund Association or PFA. Those are the top runners among the Japanese institutional investors, and they're stage three. Stage two, not many, uh, to name few. Japan Post Bank. Now stage one, famous GPIF that uh, we uh, talked about a couple of slides ago. They are stage one, i.e. they just start, uh, you know, introducing alternative investment program, but they need a gatekeeper. Next slide, please. So here's our uh, strategy. So uh, for Indian market, from the viewpoint of stage one and a stage two player, they need the platform. Because as I as we explained to you, they don't have a capability of selecting the light GP by themselves. They need somebody to pick up the light GPs. And the Indian PE market, if you talk about, you know, they say there are more than 470 GPs as of uh, 2020 EI end. That's a gigantic number. So you have to have your own curator, if you will, uh, to walk you through the Indian PE market. By PE, I mean everything. RE stage, gross capital, and buyout. We, Unison Capital Bridge, do have, uh, over the last three years or so, have established our own ecosystem amongst those GPs, including yourself. And we are also uh, expanding our relationship with LPs there. And, uh, you know, that uh, gives us another level of confidence about the future of Indian private equity market. It will deliver next 10 years. We are very, uh, uh, you know, certain about that. But our job is to let Japanese colleagues to understand why that is the case. Next slide, please. So this is our solution. Uh, as we explained to you, uh, as a Unison Capital, we have zero intention to be the 40 a 479th GP in Indian PE market. Rather, we would like to become the platform for the Japanese institutional investors and especially for uh, pension money and help them to uh, expand their allocation to Indian PE. So we are going to set up a PE gateway and we have a complete coverage, meaning uh, starting from, uh, you know, by uh, RE stage, later stage gross capital and a buyout. And we have, uh, you know, uh, we are so much into ESG, uh, Japanese uh, pension money, the next 10 years is gonna be super focused on ESG. So you need a ESG solution. And uh, we are going to uh, provide not just primary fund of funds, but we are going to provide uh, Japanese institution, institutional investors, additional alpha creation opportunity through secondary fund of funds and actively uh, making a co-investment at the portfolio company level. So this is our solution. Next slide, please. So this is our summary chart and I am going to pass the baton to my uh, friend and colleague, MJ. Uh, so as a summary, Unison Capital and a Unison Capital Bridge as a blend name will make uh, indirect investment to you, Indian GPs. And we will be highly selective because we have to be, because, uh, because we are so much into ESG. And through that uh, GP relationship, trust-based relationship, we are making a co-investment. Unlike Japan and the Korean market, 
uh, India PE market uh, because of the lack of uh, developed, uh, you know, uh, leveraged buyer, uh, leveraged uh, lending market. Uh, you guys are in the stage of uh, making a club deals, which I like. So there are increasing number of co-investment opportunity if you work with, uh, you know, fine Indian GPs. That's our target. And, uh, and, uh, and a slightly limited uh, scale and scope, we as it is on capital would like to make a direct investment too, but only with the uh, sustainability solution. To that, uh, my friend and colleague MJ will walk you through what we are doing there under this direct private equity and debt investments program. So with that, MJ, it's your time. Thank you, Dr. Yamamoto. So greetings, namaskar everyone. So good morning, good evening, wherever you might be as uh, Sri Ramsan said. So it's uh, very fortuitous that we have come to this platform to discuss bridging opportunity of long-term patient capital from Japan into India, but with a process, a process that has a bit of science in it, bit of art in it. And as uh, Yamamoto-san explained, we are very careful about ESG and we would like to exhibit, set examples how we are investing. So I'm getting an opportunity to discuss one very important direct investment as uh, Unison Capital, Unison Capital partners uh, have started to put into sustainability. So this company is called as Ideation 3X. And what is, uh, without making an advert, just to show this as an example of our ESG orientation and focus on environment. So Ideation 3X is a company that would like to be the ambassador of planet Earth to tackle the climate change. We are investing heavily into different product lines that I'll share with you. And then our idea is to start replacing billions of liters of uh, petroleum-based products by converting the material that we already have. We want to use a bit of science, which is law of conservation of matter, petroleum that is beneath the Earth's surface. When it comes back onto the Earth's surface, this matter has been beneath the Earth's surface for millions of years. So it's net carbon additive to the environment. So instead of using that more and more as petroleum product, the plastic that has been created already, which is already part of the ecosystem on the planet Earth, we would like to use that plastic, that rubber, those uh, uh, trashes, and convert that into energy, convert that into useful industrial fuel, and also remove greenhouse gases and the carbon footprint along the way. So this is an investment already made. It's working fantastically. And I'll show you four different areas where this has started to work. So uh, Ideation 3X is a portfolio uh, owner. It has four uh, companies for now. So two degrees Clicon, which is the first one on, on the left, it converts waste into energy. So we convert into uh, uh, methanol, we convert that into something called as RDF or refuse derived fuel. We convert plastic into alternative diesel fuel and plastic polymer fuel. So that's what two degree Clicon is doing very successfully. We have a few patents into this. The second company which is, uh, or the second unit is relatively new. As with COVID, the world has experienced, there's a lot of medical and hazardous waste that is being dumped especially in India, in landfills. That material can cause serious damage to the planet Earth. And if you were to burn it simply, it will probably cause a hole in the ozone layer. So given the Indian infrastructure uh, weaknesses or deficits, medical innovation has created mobile incinerators. So using technologies that we already have, uh, our patented solutions, that will miniaturize the uh, the incinerators and put it behind a truck and go from district to district. We've already created several of these and we are in operations as we speak. And this is a very good creative 
using advanced technology. We have also borrowed technology from Japan for the same to uh, create these incinerators. Third one is Ideation uh, 3X has uh, made investment into AD Catalyst. So these are additives that uh, uh, remove the, uh, the carbon or rather they help with the carbon combustion more robustly. And in the process, what it does is it uh, reduces the cost for uh, the boilers in the uh, power uh, thermal power plants. And in the process, of course, is removing the carbon footprint. And finally, airborne systems. So this is where flue gas desulfurization happens to its best. So as we know, India has created very strict laws, and so has uh, many. Other, so have many other countries around the world on the flue gas uh, that comes out in various thermal applications around the world. And airborne system can convert these flue gases through a process, which is a black box IP, in which again, Air One system has patents to useful fertilizers and other products. So again, this is to show how careful UCB, the Unison Capital Environment is to care for the environment and they have made direct investment into Ideation 3X. So thanks for uh, listening to this. We are very fired up and it completes the product cycle to us. We are in India, building GP relationships. We are making co-investments and we are making direct investment into companies. So with that, uh, thank you again uh, for listening. So on Ideation 3, 3X, I don't want to go through this. This is a proper company. It has many patents and whatnot. So over to you, Srinamsan, for any questions or comments that uh, our audience may have. Thank you. Please unmute me. Okay, there you go. Thank you, MJ. Uh, while we are waiting for questions from the audience, maybe you can take off the slides. Uh, can, you, can you close the share, MJ? Thank you. So let me uh, start with this ESG. You know, you people, both of you are PhDs. You guys are so smart, you know the latest and the bestest. I can understand why you would do it. But for a, for a, you know, average investor, if I may use that word, when they think about India from Japan, ESG is not necessarily the first thing that comes to their mind. Uh, so you can look at it in two ways, that it's an opportunity for India to actually leapfrog because the entire world is in some sense at a very low base level of ESG. Would you look at it like that? Or do you see that as an additional hurdle to be crossed before going to the investors? I mean, I'm happy to take answers from both of you. Dr. Yamamoto? Thank you, Dr. Amsal. Uh, for uh, Indian uh, companies or Indian GPs, uh, I truly believe that the ESG is a natural thing. I, I think it's already incorporated whatever you do at this juncture. That's what we call the second or third generation of GPs and entrepreneurs. And that's what we need. So, uh, you know, Japanese, uh, you know, understanding of this point is far, far behind. They had their own view back in year 2000 or something when we started, when we, Unison Capital, started making a private equity investment in Japan. 20 years is long enough to change the generation. And you are, what we are observing over the last three years uh, with MJ is, you know, everywhere in India is ESG. So that's what I like. And that's what I would like to, you know, my colleagues at, uh, with, at uh, Japanese institutional investors, uh, I, I would like them to understand this point very clearly. Does you. that answer your question? Yes, thank you. MJ, would you like to add to this? Absolutely. So if I was to expand into uh, ESG, so as uh, my dear uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Yamamoto said, ESG is almost like table stakes for investors. And I'll tell you how. The G in ESG stands for governance, 
which investor who would want his or her returns back would go low on governance and that has been in the past one of the deficits in the uh, returns for investors the governance was not optimal so that is the table stakes and what we are finding is the investors are getting premium where or rather the entrepreneurs are getting premium where the governance is high so that's that's coming across very well if you see meet with quality gps the private equity players in india they are very firm on high governance so that's important for us to exhibit to try to bridge japanese capital into india now we come in into ens part so united nations has created this pri which is the principles of responsible investment there is sustainability development goals and others without ens there is you not going to be a um, responsible investor so it is also almost a table stakes and what we are finding is combining esg is quite different from social impact investment because esg demand the returns for the investors the way the investment is made everything else the equal the environment and sustainability has to be followed and that's what is creating a lot of excitement and we find the indian gp fully at the frontier in taking the charge making esg investments beautifully we are quite impressed when we go to india and meet with gp how they are following up on esg requirements is quite impressive that's nice to hear uh, at least that's not a hurdle that needs to be crossed uh, let me just change the dimension of the conversation a little bit uh, you know the asset owner progression model that was very very educative you also mentioned a few names which are in category 3 out of japan some insurance companies and some pension funds and so on let me just keep that as the universe because the others are still not ready according to your explanation of the progression model so what is the barrier for these companies or these investors to invest long term significant capital in india is it is it a india barrier is it an asset class barrier is it some prior experience you know that is deeply buried in their memory which refuses to go away what really is the reason for these category 3 players uh, in your asset progression model not to make a big bold move vis-a-vis india dr yamato thank you for the great question uh, the uh, as i quote uh, you know from uh, one of the uh, stage 3 players i repeat you know over the last 20 years doing nothing in chinese private equity market the cost of not doing anything in that market is ex- prohibitively high i you got to be there right uh, and it's pure return thing stage 3 player uh they only uh, the only thing that matters is return risk adjusted risk adjusted return for that company whereas india over the last 20 years uh, as an asset class indian private equity it's a series of disappointment okay in terms of returns risk adjusted returns when i tell this uh, to my indian colleagues they got upset Look, Osamu, he has a track record. I know there are numbers of uh, you know cases that you you created a meaningful alpha, sometimes very handsome alpha. But for uh, the big uh, stage three player, it's just the idiosyncratic cases. They need an asset class that you know provide them. with a super return comparing to chinese private equity so that you and i got to understand we are in the competition and the competition competitor is very clear in this dimension it's chinese chinese private equity market so you have to be mindful of and when you present yourself you have to make that kind of uh, you know comparison uh, to persuade 
uh, you know, a stage three players to come in. And I am reasonably optimistic that uh, you asset class as an entity are catching up. And uh, given the, you know, macroeconomic perspective for the next 10 to 20 years, China and India, you guys are in the, you guys are in a better position. So uh, you have to concentrate on creating uh, you know, super risk re adjusted return and always mindful of your constant comparison with the Chinese market. Let me stop here. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, just a small follow up. Uh, would you say that the Indian private equity asset class is maturing? Uh, it's becoming a little more uh, stable and maturing as compared to what it was say 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, would that be a good statement to make, a correct statement to make? So uh, it depends on how, how you define the maturing part, right? And uh, much, if you say the maturing part is uh, creating uh, you know, better adjusted return, I'd say not yet. It's okay. just the beginning of uh, getting into that phase, I would argue. But if you say maturing means, you know, tons of uh, failure and tons of tears and the learning experience from that, if you call that the maturing, then you are, yes. There are tons of, uh, you know, uh, previous lessons that, that can be learned, uh, both in investment and both in fundraising. So that means you have tons of uh, you know materials that you can learn and it make your you know the uh, practice better. So if you call that whole ecosystem as a maturing, then I would say yes, you are. Understood. Understood. Thank you. So any question to you? To that also, one thing I might add: uh, the ecosystem that uh, Dr. Yamamoto talked about. So India as an ecosystem of digital infrastructure is developing very fast. Over the last uh, few years, how the technology stack that has come in, how the digital payments have been enabled, the digital follower, and less of a parallel economy than existed. From, from an investor's point of view, to track something that cannot be tracked through the bank is very difficult. So given that the environment, the ecosystem has created this uh, digital infrastructure that is, that is superior to most of the large developing, uh, developed economies also is coming to the aid. So if you were to combine that digital infrastructure with good experienced GPs with ESG orientation, the maturity is in your face. It's developing and it's apparent. Yeah, that's, that's very encouraging. I think India is very clearly on a path of very aggressive, high-paced digitalization, which can help this. Uh, which leads me to the next question. You know, when I talk to people in Japan, the macro story with India is always a super story, but somehow the micro story is always eluded. Would you say, MJ, given that you're in Singapore, you have, you know, multiple uh, investments in India, and obviously you're traveling, uh, would you say that the quality of opportunities at a micro level are getting better in the context of ESG, in the context of, you know, the kind of uh, breakthrough stuff that people are attempting to do in India? Would you say that? And would that be a tempting opportunity for the Japanese long-term capital to come in? So I'll give a politically uh, incorrect answer here. So investors, when they come in, the entry price matters quite a bit. So Indian valuations from an investors coming in is still on the higher end. So the expectations of Indian entrepreneurs for investors is still very high. But in terms of opportunity, I've been an investor and researcher for more than two decades. And I can tell you, I have never seen this fantastic an opportunity set but the entry price is high. That means the requirement for the, the expectations of investors of GPs and then their uh, in, uh, investees is 
exceptionally high. Otherwise, the risk adjusted return is not going to be adequate. Well, so in the post corona world, uh, do you think things will be very different? Because suddenly there is a lot more focus on living healthily, living with nature in a proper way, you know, not creating excess and all of that. Do you think that will be a catalyst of some sort and change stuff? Because anyway, nobody can travel now. So distance is completely irrelevant. Uh, would you think that that will bridge uh, the Japanese side and the Indian side a little faster and better? How do you see that? So I'll, I'm very curious also to know uh, uh, Yamamoto-san's answer, but my sense is when you used to speak about certain digital processes and digital uh, supply chains and uh, follow-up of businesses, I heard from many people, it's not going to be possible in India. And now COVID has changed that so dramatically. And now when people have tasted those digital uh, supply chains, the digitalization benefits, the uh, benefits of health and sanitation, or rather the hazards that there can be, not just the people, but even smaller municipality levels, they're changing their thinking. They are worried. I had never heard about uh, being an Indian, although I've lived in, uh, outside of India for uh, more than two decades, but I never heard of local population, local leaders ever talking about health and sanitation. Now that's very active part of their vocabulary, which means we ought to see changes. We ought to see, we will, I think to see changes and that opens up a whole host of opportunities post COVID. Thank you. So let me ask uh, one final question to both of you before we wind up this session. You know, as India continues to grow, as the entrepreneurial spirits continue to get unleashed in India, uh, there will be more and more requirement for capital, uh, not only in early stage, but right across the full cycle, uh, all the way up to, you know, what I call as country projects, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And all of that requires capital. At the same time, given the overall global geopolitical realignment, there is also a vacuum that may be getting created because of whatever geopolitical reasons. Now, every GP in India, I am sure is looking to raise money sooner or later. And they've all gone to the usual suspects, which is the Western world, the Australian pension funds, the Canadian pension funds, what have you, or the Middle East. Uh, Japan is, in some sense, the last frontier for them. Now, as experts, what is that one advice you would give to an Indian GP trying to raise money from Japan? Uh, I, would, I would request both of you to answer, and then we will close the session. Dr. Yamamoto? Well, the simple one, work with us. <laughs> OK. A joke aside, OK, it's, it's a half joke, half serious. But joke aside, uh, you know, the uh, uh, let me combine this answer. It's not going to be a super short answer. But uh, combine your previous question, you know, post-COVID, Japan is going to be sure. Uh, Japan is going to be a, a totally different place for two things. One is Japan's commitment to zero uh, carbon or carbon-free society by 2050. That commitment was non-existent before COVID. That's one. And second is, uh, as MJ so rightly covered, digitalization. So uh, we, I, I'm still locked down in Tokyo here, and uh, everybody's talking about, uh, you know, we have to reflow once again uh, to the digitalized world where your great nation is in right at this moment. So we have a lot of things to learn from you on that front as well. And also the first carbon free aspect, you know, like MJ explained to you, one of our portfolio companies, uh, that's kind of a technology we can work together. So, uh, you know, you are, now you ask me my piece of, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, the friendly advice uh, to our colleague, GP colleagues there, work with us. Thank you. MJ? So I would say your platform through which you were asking this question from Thai is very important. So to raise capital from Japan, the awareness of, of India, the, the opportunities macro, micro will both be important. However, I think Thai or other uh, organizations such as Thai have to lobby for some public goods. So which means ease of doing business for our investors and the judicial processes, like what the government did with the NCLT processes and others, as those public goods start to appear, it will give much more comfort to Japanese investors to put money more, more and more uh, allocation towards India. That's something that most foreign investors, including those who are already invested in India, worry about. Fantastic. Thank you so much. This is very, very educative. I think for folks who are trying to raise long-term patient capital from Japan, uh, some of the lessons from this session are going to be very, very important. Uh, at least today I learned that the asset owner progression model is a good way to think about this so that you know who is the right uh, you know, counterparty that you can actually go and make some sense of your story. Uh, that's very, very helpful. It's also very encouraging to see that the digitalization efforts of India overall uh, is a catalyst that will also make the overall sector more attractive. And I think it's now just a question of you know, working the details and staying patient to get the long-term patient capital. And I have always been a believer. Uh, I think if the two countries can meaningfully collaborate in scale, it will be super transformative, not only for both the countries, but I think it's very important for the overall global order, if you will. Thank you so much for such an educative session. And audience, uh, the next session is also an interesting session on India and Japan in the same auditorium, uh, which is a little more higher level macro scenario, if you will. Uh, please do come back for that session in another 10 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Yamamoto. Thank you, Dr. MJ, for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.